Racial Segregation It's occurred in all schools throughout the southern United States ever since the passage of the Jim Crow laws in the 19th century. This separated black and white Americans in all public affairs. Due to the historical societies of slaves in the South, and a companionment with segregated residential home owning systems, judicial rulings throughout the history of civil rights movements have worked to create equivalent opportunities for all. However, the ideals of this egalitarian society were met with immense backlash and resistance, especially as the black community began to seek after equal rights in the workplace and in schools. This controversial topic was first brought to the attention of the Supreme Court in the Plessy v. Ferguson case of 1896, which deemed that separate but equal education for black and white children was allowed within the Constitution. Later on, in the 1954 Brown v. Board Supreme Court case, ruling called for a complete renewal of civil values and presumed segregated education as unconstitutional. This ruling was not a popular opinion, especially in the Deep South. Multiple violent and absolutely degrading protests arose as families concerned for their children's safety and education began to speak out. There were mothers saying their white children shouldn't be allowed to interact or even be in the same vicinity as the blacks. And they, should, and they pushed the idea that this integration would lead to confusion and distress amongst their precious children. These communities made every excuse they possibly could to try to reason their protest against this ruling. It wasn't only suburban communities that led to these protests. But the turmoil that resulted from the Brown v. Board case began a rise in the United States Congress. The Southern Manifesto was an effort made by Southern Senators to denounce the court's ruling, saying that it was a clear abuse of judicial power. This document was signed by 19 Senators and 82 Representatives, led by Senator Harry Byrd in hopes of restoring segregation in the South. Byrd passed dozens of laws known as the mass resistance to stop or slow segregation as much as possible. The Declaration of Constitutional Principles was first introduced in March of 1956 by Chairman Howard Smith of Virginia. This document was first and foremost an act of defiance. You have these 101 members of Congress fighting back against the very system they were a part of. They disregarded and practically threw away the ruling of the Brown versus Board case and called Southerners to adopt this massive resistance, as they called it. The manifesto promised to use all lawful means to bring about the reversal of this decision, which is contrary to the Constitution, as they claimed, and to prevent the use of force in its implementation. However, force played a large role in the plan of Orville Faubus, the Southern Governor of Arkansas. Early September of 1957, a new approach to integration of schools would take place in the town of Little Rock, Arkansas, with support from the National Association for Advancement of Colored People, otherwise known as the NAACP. This association registered nine high school students to attend Central High that year, as the Brown vs. Board of Education case deemed it appropriate. The Little Rock School District approved this as well. Unfortunately, the students could never make it into school on their first day of September 4th. Just two days prior, Governor Faubus sent in Arkansas National Guard to prevent the nine children from entering. They remained on school grounds for weeks afterwards. You could imagine the intensity of the situation when folks heard that there would be black students going to a white school. It went all over the news. Reporters and mobs completely covered the school grounds for weeks, even months in many cases. Now on top of the white students and their parents yelling and threatening them, the guards won't even let them in when they go to the entrance. I think the main reason why Governor Faubus was truly siding with the segregationists here was mainly to obtain votes from the citizens of Arkansas. He was running for office again, and he knew that the majority of the state would value him more if he showed he was against this radical change in the South. Still, he claimed the troops were put in place to maintain law and order and prevent violence. Now, I don't care what the Brown versus the Board of Education case says, I will not be letting any colored students into the doors of Central High. The National Guard is meant to keep violence from breaking out and to ensure that all the kids are safe. We don't need any bloodshed on our hands. End of story. 
President Dwight Eisenhower had a different stance on this matter. Despite his attempts to persuade Faubus to call back the National Guard, Faubus kept them at Central High. More than two weeks after sending them there, Supreme Court Judge Davis forced the troops to be removed from school premises. Soon afterwards, Eisenhower sent in 1,000 troops from the 101st Airborne Division to protect the students for when they returned. Little Rock Nine's first official day of school was on September 25th. These students had the strength and determination necessary to face the adversity they knew they were going to receive. Weeks before the new school year, the students would receive intensive counseling sessions to prepare them for what to expect in their classes as well as how to respond to anticipated hostile situations. Unfortunately for some students, their situations were worse than expected. All nine students suffered physical and verbal abuse throughout their high school year. One girl in particular had her story to share. Her name is Melba Beals. She was only 16 years old at the time. The second time I went back to Central High School, I was frightened because I could see this huge mob gathered directly in front of the school as I entered the side door. I couldn't help wondering what would become of me. By noon, I had to be escorted because the mob was overrunning the school, rushing towards us and past the police. Despite the hardships that Melba endured, her family was there to support her throughout most of the school year. Melba's grandmother specifically encouraged Melba when she lost motivation to continue going to school, reminding her that she was the spark of a national movement. If someone called me names or spat on me or kicked me in the shin or walked on my heel, I thought I, wouldn't, I couldn't take it anymore. But each time I would go home, my grandmother would point out that I was not doing it for myself. I was doing it for generations yet reborn. However, Melba couldn't always find solace in just her family. After time, she'd begin to have to rely on herself for encouragement once more. At Central High School, I had to leave my family, and because of the Ku Klux Klan's, had a price on my head of $10,000 dead and $5,000 alive. The abuse that these students suffered from was day in and day out. All they could do was let the abuse go on. Nonviolence was the civil and effective way to deal with the cruelty with students. You get tripped, people would just walk up and hit you in the face. You couldn't hit back. We'd been instructed by this time that any attempts to hit back, to respond, to call a name in response would mean the end of the case. To Melba, her troops were only allowed to escort her through the hallways between classes, before school, and after school. They couldn't go into the classroom with her, which is essentially when she was the most vulnerable. Other times, the white students would attack Melba, regardless of whether or not her guard was next to her. In study hall, kids would walk by and drop a lighted piece of paper on your books. We changed books. We changed books as much as three or four times a week. You go to your locker and there would be ink all over everything you own. I was walking down the hall one day with my personal guard. His name was Johnny Black, and at that time, somebody spewed acid in my eye. I had long hair too, and he took my braid and slammed my head beneath the water faucet. One of Melba's friends, Minna Jean Brown, dealt with the abuse in a different way than the rest of the nine students. One day in the cafeteria, a couple of boys had continuously been pushing chairs in her way, so Minna Jean poured her bowl of chili onto two of them. She was suspended for six days. Later on in the school year, a group of girls threw a purse full of combination locks at her. She yelled at them and called them white trash, in return getting herself immediately expelled next day you'd come in and they'd throw ink at you or they throw a rock across the room at you or they call you a nigger as you walked in the front door. Am I going to be hanged or am I going to get it over the head? Am I going to be hit in the back of the head with something or am I going to be blown up with a stick of dynamite? Despite all the hardships, the remaining eight students survived the entire school year. Ernest Green, a 17 year old, was the first ever African American to graduate Central High School. For the time being, he would also be the only black student to graduate. The following year, Governor Favis closed all schools in the Little Rock School District to pen a public vote for preventing African American attendance. The votes revealed an anti-integrationist view of the population, and the schools remained closed. The rest of the Little Rock Nine group would go on to graduate from other high schools close by. I learned that the color of racism is neither black or white. It is an entity. The color of hatred is neither black nor white. Some of the people who were the kindest to me in my life, like those troops, have been white. 
And for all those people who are negative and want to look at the glass half empty and who want to say that the Brown decision didn't make any difference and we hadn't made any progress, I say that you're wrong. We have made progress. Because I've come a long way. It is a long, long way from being a little girl who grew up in Little Rock and sat in the back of the bus and drank from water fountains marked color and went to a black school in an apartheid society. I just want to say also that we all need each other. Love is the answer. And that anytime you look at another human being, the same God that exists in you exists in them. And no matter where they come from, who they worship, or what they wear, you owe them eye contact, consideration, and a smile, at the very least.